Hello and welcome to the media division. It's late Christmas for the owners of an EVA 1 or those who want to be in the future because there's a major release today of the new firmware. It's 3.0 time for Panasonic EVA 1 and we get a whole bunch of new codec. Yes, HEVC is introduced to EVA 1 with a lot of options and one of it is 4K at 60 frames per second, 10-bit internal. And something which I find even more uh, thrilling for my work is we finally gonna get presets allowing you to switch between raw and high frames so in just a matter of seconds as the admin of the largest Ava one Facebook group I was given the chance to test the beta of this new firmware so I can give you a bit more than just reading you what's in the press release I can actually give you footage and I was irresponsible enough to actually use the new firmware on a job so I can even give you some real life footage. If you're one of the members of my channel who's not into EVA 1, no problem. Last week I made a new episode where I actually simulate a Super 35 sensor on a GH5 and I'm gonna compare that to a speed boosted GS5. And that's very interesting to evaluate uh, what a speed booster really does to an image. And I, as far as I know, that's even um, a, a first. And even if you don't have a GH5, if there is a speed booster available for your system, that might be interesting too. So I just put the link up there. And if you're not interested in it, you just go that. For the rest of you, come along. As this is a short YouTube video, I cannot go in every detail about this firmware, but there are three key features in my opinion, and I want to go into those. And those are going to be the codex, HEVC, of course, or H265, if you prefer that. And um, then there is the um, uh, presets, which is coined Quick Switch from Panasonic. And there's something that Panasonic calls EVA Life, and that just means you don't have to use the um, Wi-Fi adapter, but you can use a cheaper and more stable tethered version to um, uh, remotely control EVA. So let's begin with the codex. There's the HEVC implementation or H265 if you prefer that. And um, they're, they're all 10 bits and they uh, come in two flavors. A is 150 megabits per second for the lower frame rates, like 24, 25, 30. And for the higher frame rates, that's 200 megabits per second. Again, 10 bit. All of this codex are 420 and not 422 like the H264. Another cool thing about this alternative to the H264 is that uh, macOS is able to recognize the files when you have them on the card or on your system. You can actually see thumbnails. Uh, you can play them right in QuickTime. No problem. I love it. I always hated that I couldn't see right away what what is. Now, where is the advantage from HEVC over H.264? You probably know that the efficiency of H.265 is higher than it is with H.264. So theoretically, you should get an uh, uh, image quality that's about twice as good uh, at the same bandwidth. Or you can have half the bandwidth at the same image quality. Of course, we are not interested so much in the half the bandwidth. We are more interested in twice the image quality. And the question here really is, um, the 150 megabits H.264 is very good and I couldn't really see a, a huge difference between uh, a ProRes RAW HQ or the H.264. Now theoretically, at the same, because it has the same bandwidth, the H.265 should be significantly better. And we're going to find out by first doing some tests uh, on 24 frames per second as well as on 60 frames per second. And then I show you some real life example where you just put them next to each other and see what's going on there.
I cannot see any relevant difference at all. But you might think that's YouTube, due to the YouTube compression and you might be right about that. But I would have a really, really hard time to tell the files apart, except for, of course, their size and their performance in the NLA, um, even from a 4K uh, display sitting 20 centimeters away from it and really trying to figure out which is which. I probably couldn't. If you have a high magnification, you see that the HEVC does reduce uh, the um, um, grain or noise of the image uh, quite a bit. I think that's due to the codec that just swallows it. So that could be even an advantage, but that's completely up to you. Um, if you're into uh, a fine grain in your image and you want to keep that, um, I would stay with an all eye codec or uh, ProRes, which is an all eye codec too, uh, and avoid the HEVC. Um, for most application, it won't matter that much. So should one use the H.264 or the H.265 codex? That's the question. With the 60 frames per second, it's pretty much a no-brainer because the internal codec was a for, for an 8-bit 4 to 0 before and now it's a 10-bit 4 to 0. So just go with the HEVC and you can't go wrong with that. But how about the, the base codec for 24, uh, 25, 30 frames per second? This is the same bandwidth, um, better efficiency, so the image quality is supposed to be better, but the color sampling is significantly lower. It has half of the color information in that file. So which one to use? I, I guess for green screen, I would definitely go with a 422. But um, for the rest of it, um, I had a little discussion with uh, Mitch from Panasonic and um, he was, has the opinion that the 422 only is important or is of relevant importance if you are delivering interlaced. And it does make a lot of uh, sense if you know what color sampling is and how it works. So if you go for a progressive delivery, the HEVC can be a real alternative to the old main codex. You might think, hey, uh, isn't it possible now that we have HEVC and uh, 60 frames per second codec, maybe it's possible to get the 5.7K um, as an internal kernel codec. And um, I asked that and tortured a bit and it seems like this is technically uh, impossible. Well, you never, should never say never, but um, it's very unlikely to come at this point. So if you want to go, 5.7K, then you will have, have to stick to ProRes RAW. Next up are the presets. First of all, thank you, thank you, thank you, Panasonic. You made my life so much easier. You, ah, thank you. It was about time. Um, having tried this on the on on event, I can really say like, well, it just works and that's a good thing. The quick switch function feels and looks a little bit like an afterthought, which it basically is but it gives you some cool opportunities. Let's talk about it. First of all, the presets are saved to the SD cards you record on. No card in the slots, no presets. You can choose which slot Eva looks for the preset, so you could carry two different sets at the same time and as many in your pocket as you wish. All you need to do to generate a preset, put a card in a slot, save the settings you are in under the name of your choice. It is the most practical to assign a user button to the quick switch function. I assign the one that will call up the setup files on the selected card. A preset seems to include each and every settings of your camera. Of course that makes this very practical, but it's hard to remain the master of your settings. Eva's file system only supports files with 8 digits and it can be hard to find names that are sufficient to embody all the possible key settings. You will get cryptic names and seen in dozens of those. Uh, it would make Rain Man cry. So I chose to make only a few presets that make me find my way around quickly. Here comes the really cool thing about the quick switch function. And that is you can just copy the files from one card to the next, put them in many EVAs, for example, for a, for a multicam setup shot, and you can be absolutely sure that the cameras are synchronized in terms of frame rate, codec, white balance, etc. And if you have the guts, you can take the presets, open them in a text editor on your computer and go into editing 
the values manually. Let me show you. Altering the setup files reminds me a bit of cheating in old computer games by changing the level scripts. Now, imagine you have a job that is using handheld work with an HD monitor, but all your settings are set to 4K HDMI out to allow recording to a Shogun. To find out what line triggers the HDMI out, change the HDMI output from 4K to Full HD and save a new file. A text editor like BBEdit can show you the difference between the files. And here it is in line 125. 4K is 0 and HD is plus 4. One multi-file find and replace action and presto. Copy those files back to the card and you're good to go. In the future Panasonic or a third party might get the idea to release a simple editor to change the files in a more convenient way. Of course I would always test those changes that you made uh, to the files uh, uh, before you use them on a job. And um, I always have uh, a set of unaltered uh, settings on one card in my pocket just in case. But I now have quite a, a variation of, of uh, pre-made settings for different white balances for different uh, uh, monitor outputs and so on my desktop and I can just put them on a card, throw them in and I'm, I'm, I'm totally set for almost any kind of job you would throw on me. Next up is something that I was looking forward to and that's EVA Live. That means um, basically tethering EVA. And if you think that it is um, just putting a USB lightning connector and put it in, uh, into EVA and using the, the ROB app from your phone or an iPad, um, unfortunately, uh, that's not the case. Um, the whole function is more for integrating uh, EVA into studio environments. If you want to use the remote app for EVA with a cable or you want to control multiple EVAs with the Cyanview remote control panel, you will have to wire one of three supported USB to Ethernet adapters. They are on Amazon and cheap. Then you plug in a CAT cable and connect that to a network hub. On the other end, you use a lightning to Ethernet adapter and you do the same thing. Set your iOS device to LAN, change some setting in the EVA and Nothing happens. The process did not work for me. Maybe the iPhone app is not supported yet, but I don't have an iPad with Lightning Connector to try that. Maybe it's because of the beta, maybe it did something wrong as the documentation is next to non-existent at this time, or maybe I'm plainly stupid. All is possible. If you have any doubts about the use of HEVC, uh, at least for the use uh, in social media like YouTube in this case, um, you may, might not have realized that um, this half of the screen was the uh, HEVC codec and this half of the screen actually is ProRes HQ. And if you didn't notice at any time in this video, well, that should tell you something. So I hope you found this interesting and useful. Uh, please like and subscribe if you did so. And I've got some cool stuff coming up right now. I'm building uh, do-it-yourself uh, Ultra Panavision 70 setup. Uh, yes, that's uh, medium format um, uh, anamorphics and that's just cool. So bing the bell there so you don't miss that. This is Nicholas from the Media Division signing out. Until next time, shoot something amazing.